All right, all right, bring it back in. I tell you what, it might be my favorite time of the month is this moment right here where all of you are just like enjoying the coffee and having conversations. And I have to force you to be quiet now and listen to what we're talking about today. You know, uh, the internet has some strong opinions on celebrity sellouts. You know what a sellout is, right? A person who, who compromises their style as a creator or maybe a person who, who compromises their, their brand as, as a company or compromises their, their artisanship or a person who compromises their personal integrity for the purpose of personal gain or money or some desire that they have. A sellout, right? So a sellout is, as the internet would define, a sellout is like Miley Cyrus, you know Miley Cyrus, she's, she started out as that Disney Channel kid celebrity on Hannah Montana, and she was defined by the character who loved her dad and sang country music. But then in an interview when she turned 17, she said, my 13-year-old self would want to beat up my 17-year-old self because she'd be like, girl, you're a sellout. Now that happens. The internet also would define a person like George Lucas as a sellout. Anybody with me on this? He took the Star Wars franchise, and in the late 90s, he, he created the prequels, you know, episodes one, two, and three, and fans, man, they, they just blasted him for being a sellout, that all he wanted was more merchandise money, that he could sell more action figures and toy lightsabers, and, and now 20 years later, he sold the entire thing to Disney, and they're running the thing into the ground. He's a sellout. Another sellout is like Katy Perry. You know, Katy Perry, the popular artist, uh, musical artist, she grew up as the daughter of a preacher, and she was singing gospel rock and roll hymns, and then later on, she sold out somewhere along the line and wrote that song about kissing a girl. <laughs> look, look, somewhere she sold out, right? Don't be a sellout. Nobody wants to be a sellout. Nobody likes a sellout, but truth is, honestly, like... <laughs> We are all sellouts in some shape or form. We have all compromised our morals, our beliefs, our faith for our own personal benefit, gain, or comfort. We're all sellouts. And what we've been reading in the book of Judges is that the people of Israel are massive sellouts. Right? They, they all did what was right in their own eyes. That's our theme verse in Judges 21, verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and so every man did what was right in his own eyes. Even God's divinely appointed judges were doing what was right in their own eyes. They were sellouts. They sold out their morality and their integrity for personal pleasure and desires. That's where we are today in Judges chapters 14, 15, and 16. We read about the judge. His name is Samson. And Samson, he was the strong judge. Literally, he was a person of great strength. God blessed him with this miraculous strength. He was able to defeat tens of thousands of enemies all by himself. But Samson was a sellout. And in the end, he sold out his morals and his integrity, his dedication to the Lord for his own personal pleasures and desires. Samson was born to be a judge of Israel. His origin story, if you will, as if he's a superhero, right? Like an origin story in a comic book. He, he was this great person of supernatural strength. His origin story was one of miraculous proportions. In fact, it even calls back to stories of old in the Old Testament his origin story sounds a lot like the story of Abraham and Sarah who could not conceive a baby on their own, but an angel of the Lord came to them and told them that they would have a child of their own and that child would grow up to be dedicated to service for the Lord. The same thing happened to Samson's parents. In Judges chapter 14, his origin story, his mother and father, an angel of the Lord came to them and, and told them that they would have a son and this son would be dedicated to service to the service of the Lord in Israel, but that this boy would be set apart, not just spiritually, but also physically he would be set apart, for from, from the very moment of his birth, he would be required to adhere to the Nazarite vow, which would make him very distinguished among all of the people in Israel, 
He would be very recognizable as a person who was set apart for service and dedication to the Lord. The Nazarite vow. What in the world is the Nazarite vow? The first place we see this in Scripture is in Numbers chapter 6. Number 6 is the explanation of what a person should do when they voluntarily accept the Nazarite vow. This is what a person should do. Rather, number 6 outlines what that person should not do. If you take the Nazarite vow, there were very strict stipulations on what you should not do so that you could be dedicated and set apart for the Lord's work. One thing that a person who takes the Nazarite vow should not do is do not eat or drink from the vine, a grapevine. In other words, do not eat grapes, do not drink any wine, anything that is produced from the vine should not touch this person's lips if they have taken the Nazarite vow. Another thing that they should not do is do not cut your hair. This is a really interesting feature, an interesting distinction of a person who took the Nazarite vow. Your hair grows, and when it it grows long and you don't brush it, you don't wash it like we do every day, if you don't do that, your hair naturally with all the oils and dirt that it collects throughout day-to-day life, it becomes matted and it clumps together and it turns into dreadlocks, which would be very distinguishable, very recognizable in your city or your town or your village. That person has taken the Nazarite vow. The third thing that you should not do is never go near a dead body. Not just a human who has died, but even that of animals Do not approach or be near anything that is dead so that you will not be contaminated by death itself, that it it may not be transferred to you. So the Nazarite takes this vow, and they're supposed to adhere to these very strict rules. But if you read the whole passage in number 6, verses 1 through 21, you'll find that there is a time when the vow could come to an end. Like There are very distinct outlines of what a person should do when their Nazarite vow expired. So you take this vow voluntarily that you want to be set apart for the Lord and do his work, and then at some point, your work will end. This vow will come to a close, and and the instructions are that you are to go to the tabernacle and then later to the temple, and there was a special place in the temple where the priest would shave your head, and then you would place that hair on the altar of burnt offerings to make that sacrifice to the Lord, and that concluded your Nazarite vow. Okay, but in the narrative of Samson in Judges 14, 15, and 16, we get the feeling that Samson's vow was for life, that there was no end date. We're not shown that there was a specific point in time that God said you'd be set apart and then one day you'll pass the baton to someone else, or or that one day I won't require all these things of you anymore. And so from, from even before the time he was conceived in his mother's womb, it had already been decided that he would take the vow and adhere to this vow for the rest of his life. Now, I don't know about you, but in my reading of Scripture, I have never, with the exception of Jesus himself, I've never read of a single person who has taken a vow or even followed the laws of God perfectly without failure. And so from the very beginning of his story, we get the feeling that Samson, he's going to have some failures along the way. It's like a young man who started a new summer job just to make some money over his summer break. He was working on a, a team that was renovating warehouses And he showed up on the first day of the job, and his boss said, all right, I want you to take this machine, and I want you to grind the floor and strip away the old wax, and then come back and reapply a new wax finish to the floor, and then come back and tell me when you're finished, I'll give you your next job. And the kid's like, I don't know how to do this. This is my first day on the job. I've never touched this machine before. I don't know how hard to grind the floor in order to get the wax removed, and I definitely don't know how to pour and lay new wax on the floor. Like, 
I can't do this. And the boss got mad at him. Well, why'd you even apply for the job in the first place if you don't know how to do this work? And he threatened to fire him and the poor kid. He was just destined for failure before he even began. He was set up to fail in a job that he could never succeed in. Now, I'm not suggesting that God set up Samson for failure. That would not be right. God did not set Samson up to fail by taking this Nazarite vow. But perhaps the perception of who Samson is is what is failing for us. Like, bear with me. Maybe the way that we perceive who Samson is in the narrative of Scripture, that, that he was born in this miraculous way, announced by the angel of the Lord that he would be dedicated and set apart for the Lord. And in this way, he would become a redeemer for the people of Israel. That sounds a whole lot like what we see in the future in the New Testament when the angel came to Mary and said, you will conceive a son of miraculous work. And that son will be called Emmanuel, God with us. And he will be set apart and dedicated for the Lord's work on earth. And he will become a redeemer for Israel and the entire world. The parallel is that we might be looking and the people in Israel might be looking at Samson as as a Messiah of sorts. Like a pre-Messianic figure who will save them from all of their troubles. And if that's our perception of Samson, then yeah, this man is set up for failure before he even began. He cannot live up to the standard that is perceived of him. Dad's in the room. It's Father's Day, and so I want to talk to the dads for just a second. I mean, moms, this applies to you too as as parents, but today's Father's Day. Can we just have one day? Can we do that, please? (laughs) Dads, dads, we are, we are very misunderstood, aren't we? Just as dads, like, you know, we're just misunderstood. We are. We are poor babies, Miss Linda. We are poor babies. Women don't get us. They don't get, they don't get why we do the things that we do. They don't understand the methods to our madness. And more often than not, we get called failures when really we're just being geniuses in our own way, right? Like, like the dad... Like the dad who went to the grocery store with his kid and was pushing his kid in the stroller but couldn't figure out how to push the stroller and push the grocery cart. And so this is what he did. He just piled the groceries on top of his kid. (laughs) I look at that and think, well done, dad. You made do out of a difficult situation. But moms might look at that and say, you failed. You're a failure. Or the dad who, who was changing his kid's diaper trying to give mom a little break, right? And they were out enjoying a picnic. And after the diaper change, he put his kid on his shoulders. And later in the day, he felt something warm running down his backside. <laughs> nice try, Dad. But you failed. Or like the dad who took his son to the hardware store. And, you know, dads, they get in uh, like, like uh, It's like home improvement style. They get in there. They're playing with the stuff as they walk down the aisles. And then all of a sudden, there's a cry for help. And one of the workers comes around the side of the aisle. And here's the dad. <laughs> Plunged his son in the back. And the plunger would not come unstuck. <laughs> it's a good lesson in physics, I suppose. But... You failed, dads. We are set up for failure, aren't we? Like, it doesn't matter how hard we try, whatever we do, we will always end up failing in some way or another. (laughs) More seriously, like, more seriously, you might try really hard to be the best dad you can be. And, like, dads, we have this complex, don't we? Like, as men, we want to be the providers We want to be strong for our families. We want to set our our wives and our children up for success. We we, we want to be champions for the people in our homes. Often we want to help our kids avoid the mistakes that we made in the past. Knowing that what we did in the past doesn't work out for good and and we want to help our kids to, to avoid those things. And so We spend all of our efforts on that, but really, no matter how hard we try, we cannot make our children, we cannot make our children, I'm sorry, (laughs) 
We cannot make our children do as we say. And in our efforts to try and prevent bad outcomes in our families, what you realize along the way is that that your kids are picking up on unhealthy tendencies, like the way you handle stress or the way that you deal with anger or the way that you carry disappointment, and kids are picking up on that. And so no matter how hard you try as a dad, right, no matter how hard you try to be the best dad, you end up failing. And maybe that failure stems from your perception of yourself as a dad and that you have taken upon yourself the role of of savior for your family. And maybe that is is in the back of your mind or maybe it's in the front of your mind and like just as a man you want to be the savior of your family but dads I'm telling you you are not the saviors of your family. There is only one who is the savior of the world and if he's good enough to save the world he's good enough to save your family. And as a dad, what's expected of you is not to be a perfect dad, but what God expects of you is that you would be a dad who each day moves towards him and leads your family in his direction. See, that's what we learn in the story of Samson, that God is not looking for perfection because Samson is going to fail. And judges before him failed. And people after him in Israel are going to fail to live up to the standard of God. But God is not looking for perfection. He's looking for people who will move in his direction one day at a time. And when you do that, in the New Testament era with Jesus, we rely on grace to take over and fill in the gaps when we fail. So yes, dads, you will fail. It's inevitable. But as long as you're pursuing Christ, day in and day out, the story of Scripture is that God will use you to work and do good in your family for his name. Along the way, though, be careful not to sell out. In Judges 16, we we read that Samson, Samson, he, he, he sells out. And this isn't the first time that this has happened. You see, Samson, he was very strong and capable, and he was a mighty warrior, but, man, he had a weak spot for women. In fact, it was a very particular group of women. Samson had a weak spot for foreign women. It was was women who grew up in Canaan. It was Palestinian women. In, in, in Judges 16, we read that Samson met another Palestinian woman and he fell deeply in love with her. This is not the first time. It happened earlier in the story and now it's happening again. You'd think that he would have learned his lesson the first time, but he doesn't. And here he is again having a relationship with a woman that he's not supposed to have a relationship. Like, what is his deal? I mean, were Hebrew women just not attractive in those days? Or was it that Samson was more attracted to the things that he should not have? Samson, he gives us a strong lesson in this narrative. And it's a strong lesson for everybody in the room, but especially for young people. So I've been talking to dads for a while, but dads, this might be a lesson that you try and talk to your kids about. Young people in the room who are in dating relationships or hope to be in one someday, Scripture here is telling us, don't go steady with unbelievers. Amen. Don't do it. Like, Don't go steady with unbelievers. I've heard it before. Maybe you've heard the phrase, well... But well, even though she's not a Christian, I plan on bringing her to church. Like I want her to meet everybody at church and I want her to get involved with me at church. But nine times out of ten, what happens is you will stop coming to church and she'll never come with you. Or maybe, dads, you've heard your daughter say that terrible phrase that just makes your stomach churn. Well, I think I can change him. No, sweetie, you can't. Really, wanting to change somebody is not a good reason to get into relationship with that person. This is a terrible way to start a relationship. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, 
The passage is talking about idolatry, which is rampant in the book of Judges, but it is relevant to dating relationships and is pretty sound premarital advice. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, it says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? You see, nothing is going to make you sell out your faith faster than romance. What relationship can light have with darkness? If there's any physicists in the room, you know there is no relationship between light and darkness. You see, if there is darkness, it means there is an absence of light. Light does not exist in darkness. And the converse is, if there is light, then there is no darkness anymore. For light has illuminated whatever darkness was there. This story of Samson in Judges chapter 16 is a play on this visual image that light and darkness cannot exist at the same time and in the same place. Samson's name literally means like the sun. And so we get the idea that Samson, this great judge of Israel, is, is like, or at least he's portrayed in the narrative, like the great light source in our solar system. That This light source that produces heat and energy and life, Samson himself is is like the conduit through which God's life-giving power is coming to Israel. So Samson is like the sun, the major light source, but then we meet Delilah, whose name comes from the root Delayla, which means of the night. And immediately we see this mental image that day and night, these two things are like oil and water. They just don't mix. How can there be relationship between light and darkness? But we are going to see really quickly in Judges 16, they have no relationship as the woman, Delilah, dealt in secret with her countrymen to plan the demise of her husband, Samson. Judges 16, verses 1 through 31, you see the kings of Canaan got together and they they brought Delilah into the room and said, Delilah, all we need is the secret to Samson's strength. If you can just figure out what makes him so strong and what his weakness is, we'll give you 1,100 silver pieces as payment so Delilah, she went home that night, and oh, she had a great plan. She, she cooked up Samson's favorite meal, steak and potatoes. Man, it was a hearty meal for a hearty man. And Samson came in that night, and there was his favorite meal all out on the kitchen table. Oh, this is wonderful. He sat down, and they began to feast together. And Delilah just asked Grace, how was your day, sweetie? Oh, it was good, Samson said. It was a great day in the field. I got my workout on. It was great. And now this wonderful meal. Thank you for this, sweetheart. How was your day? Oh, it was nice. I, I went into town, and I saw, I saw some people today, and then I did some housework. And I just, I love you so much. I just wanted to make this wonderful meal for you, Samson, because you are, you're the strongest man I've ever known. <laughs> Babe. Babe, we've we've been together long enough. What's the secret to your strength? Is there anything, my strong man, is there anything that can contain you? And Samson, with his chest puffed out and his head way overinflated, he he said, you know what? I've always thought that if, if you tied me up with seven cords, if you tied me up with seven fresh tendons, then you know what? I think that that will cause me to become weak. So that night, Samson lay down for bed, and secretly his wife tied cords around him, seven of them to be exact. All the while, his enemies, the Philistines, were camped just outside the house, waiting for the signal to come in and ambush him. When Delilah finished tying the strings together, she yelled out, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And the enemy came barging into the house to ambush Samson, and he got up out of the bed and broke open the cords and drove his enemies back out the front door. Well, the next night, the dinner table was a little more awkward. It was a little more quiet this time. As they poked around at their food on their plates, eventually Delilah spoke up and said, Hon, you really embarrassed me yesterday. 
You told me that, that if I tied you up with cords, you'd become weak, but you lied. That was embarrassing for me. Come, come on, tell me the truth. All right, he said. Uh, you know, I thought it was being tied up. Maybe it was what you tied me with. Uh, so instead of the, the cords, this time, if you tied me up with fresh, unused ropes, surely my strength will leave me. So Delilah went out and got the fresh, unused ropes, and that night he went to bed, and she secretly tied him up with ropes. All the while, his enemies camped outside the door just waiting for the signal, and she finished tying the last rope, and she yelled out, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are upon you! And they came barging in the door to ambush this man, and he got up out of bed and broke open the ropes and drove his enemies back out the door. Well, now she's mad, right? This is twice now. Fool me once, shame on you fool me twice, shame on me. Now she's angry. Hun, you have tricked me twice. Why are you mocking me? Like, am I just, is this just a game to you? Do you not respect me? Why are you mocking me? Tell me the truth. And Samson says, okay, okay, it wasn't the ropes, it wasn't being tied, but it, it does have something to do with my hair. He doesn't quite give her all the info, but he's getting close. He says, it is my hair. If you take my long hair and you take all the locks and you braid them together and you put a pin in it to hold the braid together, then I think my strength will leave me. And so she felt bad and wanted to, she wanted to apologize for the harsh things she said. So she sat down on the couch, and Samson laid down and put his head in her lap, and she just played with his hair. And after a while, Samson nodded off and fell asleep. And very delicately, she braided his hair into one long braid and put a pin in it to hold it all together. And about that time, she yelled out, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And they came barging in the front door to ambush this man. And he got up out of the couch and pulled the pin out of his hair and whipped it around like a superhero and drove them all back out the front door. <laughs> Samson, you don't love me. <laughs> How could you love me if you won't just tell me the truth? I mean, let's pause for a moment. What a narcissistic psychopath. I mean, she gaslit him until he was forced to sell out his faith. She made him feel bad for something that he wasn't doing wrong. And he bought into it. And it was at this point Samson said, you know what? You're right. It is my hair, but it has nothing to do with the style it has everything to do with the length. If you were to shave my head, my vow would be broken, and very surely my strength would leave me, and I would be just like a normal man. And so that evening, his wife secretly shaved the hair off of his head, and urgently, he was awoken by Delilah screaming, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And they came through the front door like the last three times. And this time when Samson got up to fight back, he realized that he had no strength. And the Philistines bound him in chains and they gouged out his eyeballs and they took him back to be a prisoner and grind grain for the rest of his miserable days. But he was a sellout. He sold out. And for what? What did he gain by selling out his commitment to God? Was it, was it for love? His wife was never really interested in him to begin with. Was it for pleasure? The poor man was abused more than he was loved. Was it for power? When in the end, he lost all of his strength and his power in Israel? Was it for position when his final days he would live as a slave in the prison of Canaan? See, this is what Satan does to us. He sneaks in and quietly whispers to you that if you'll just give me a little, I'll give you a lot. If you'll just sell out just a little bit, it'll be for your pleasure. 
It, it'll be for your profit. It'll be for your gain. Maybe it is for things like romantic love that you yearn for or success in your job or with your family or for personal pleasures or for the creature comforts of life. But I say to you what Jesus says in the New Testament, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Amen. There was a young preacher who moved to a new town to become the pastor at a new church. When he got to this new town, he didn't have a car, and so each day he had to get up and take the bus from home to work and then back again to and from the church. He rode the bus every day. People began to recognize him on that route. Well, one day he got on the bus and he paid the bus fare, but the bus driver gave him too much change And he went back and sat in his usual seat at the back of the bus, and he sat down and looked, and sure enough, 25 cents extra. The bus driver made a mistake. So he thought, okay, this is simple enough. Uh, uh, At the next stop, I'll just go up to the bus driver and tell him he made a mistake and give him back the 25 cents. No problem. But as the bus rolled on, so his thoughts rolled on in his head. And this young preacher thought to himself, you know, what's, what's 25 cents? You know, like the bus company's not going to go broke over this minuscule amount of money. Like, you know what? Maybe, maybe this 25 cents was a blessing from God for me today. Maybe this was God's little wink at me today to keep up the good work, man. And he convinced himself on the seat in the back of the bus that he was just going to keep that quarter in his pocket. Well, they got to his bus stop and He began that walk from the back of the bus to the front of the bus. And man, it was a long walk today. Before he got to the front, his conscience got the best of him. He couldn't help it. He reached in his pocket and pulled out the money. And he leaned over and said, hey, man, you made a mistake. You gave me a little too much change. Here's the 25 cents that I owe you. And the bus driver, an older gentleman, looked up over his shoulder with a smile on his face and said, son, that was no mistake. You see, I I knew that you're new in town and you're that new preacher at the church downtown and I just wanted to see what you'd do. The older man looked up at the young preacher and said, you know what, preacher? I'll see you on Sunday morning at church. Well, the young preacher, he stepped out of the bus and found the nearest light post and leaned against it and let out a sigh of relief. Oh God, I almost sold your son for a quarter. (laughs) You and I have little moments every day, every day where we can either be sold out for Jesus or sell out your faith. Be sold out for Jesus or sell out your faith. And the question for you every day, what will you do? Is Jesus Lord of your life or is there something else you're pursuing other than him? Lord God, we ask this morning that you will empower us, encourage us daily, God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, that we would be totally sold out for Jesus. Jesus, we look to you because you came and lived the perfect life and you died on the cross so that we wouldn't have to die the sinner's death. And then three days later, you resurrected from the grave so that we could know and experience eternal life with you in heaven. Jesus, we thank you and we praise you.